All right, thanks everyone. I'm Dr. Mike Frederick in Applied Behavioral Sciences. I'm going to tell you a bit about my search for a biomarker of life history. Uh, do proteins record our harsh life experiences? So in life, as individuals, we face a series of trade-offs, right? Do you go to college or do you go directly into the MBA? <laughs> right, like LeBron. Uh, we've all had to make that decision. Uh, do you save for retirement or do you buy that new Jaguar you really want? Uh, do you hold off on having kids or do you have 10 kids? Probably can't do both. Uh, so all of these, but especially that last one, fit what uh, has become known as life history theory. Uh, so the idea being that uh, you can pursue life in a couple different ways, and broadly, if you take a fast strategy, uh, you, you go for short-term goals, and you try to achieve your goals quickly, uh, you try to reproduce quickly and often, uh, and you don't overinvest in any one particular offspring. Uh, this applies across species, but to humans as well. Slow strategy means that you are going to take your time, plan carefully, find the perfect mate, uh, collect resources, and then reproduce and invest a lot in fewer offspring. Uh, now, sometimes we think about these trade-offs and decisions consciously, but not always. A lot of times people just make these decisions. So what's leading them to do that? Well, part of it might be genetic, but I'm more interested in the environmental side of it, uh, the programming side of it, and how perhaps neurochemistry can be set early on uh, to fit certain environments. We are starting to realize there are physiological differences between these strategies, neurochemical differences. And the ideal strategy actually depends on environmental conditions. So generally, I think it's smarter to play the slow game, uh, but when the environment's really turbulent, it actually makes sense to go for short-term goals. So a harsh environment tends to push individuals towards a faster strategy. A nurturing environment tends to push them towards a slow strategy. Uh, now, one of the best known examples of this comes from rats, uh, actually. Mother rats groom and lick their newborn rat pups, but they vary in how much they do this. And when mother rats don't groom their pups very much and don't lick them a lot, uh, then the offspring grow up to have hypersensitive stress systems, and they're extra jumpy, extra anxious. If they're licked and groomed a lot, uh, they're less anxious, they're more relaxed, right? So a harsh environment might lead a mother rat to be unable to groom her pups as much, and that leads to anxious offspring that are more vigilant in the environment. Uh, in a nurturing environment, the mother rat licks and grooms her pups a lot, and even a, a human experimenter can do this with a Q-tip. All it takes is a little tactile stimulation to the pups during this critical window, and that leads to these epigenetic changes, cause those offspring to be more relaxed, right? <laughs> Less anxious. What about humans, though? It's, we can't do these sort of invasive uh, stress studies on uh, you know, newborn humans. So um, we do have ways of measuring fast strategy behaviors in humans. They tend to be higher in sensation seeking, uh, more outgoing sexually, more impulsive in general. But how do we measure the developmental harshness? Well, in the past, you know, some research has looked at high stress cohorts if people have experienced a lot of stress. Uh, you can self-report childhood socioeconomic status, so that's kind of one way to measure early stress. You can look at birth weight, but none of these are that great. None of these fully capture the stress of life. So can we do better? I've been on the search to find a better biomarker for environmental harshness, something we can measure objectively. Uh, and I settled on one candidate, an interleukin-6, or IL-6. It's a cytokine protein involved in the immune response. Levels fluctuate, but they also accumulate over time, and they're elevated by stress. Uh, so in 2018, I enlisted the help of Dr. Ingrid Tulloch, a neuroscientist at Morgan State, uh, and we began what some of my colleagues called the vampire study, as we start uh, collecting blood from our participants, capillary blood samples, uh, to measure this IL-6. Um, sadly, we had some setbacks. So first, we had a freezer malfunction at another institution that will go unnamed. Uh, <laughs> lost 58 blood samples. Uh, and then we had some calibration issues with new equipment. Uh, and in the end, we were forced to uh, face up to the fact that we probably weren't collecting enough blood. Right? We, these little capillary samples may just not have been enough. The assays have gotten better, the equipment's better, but Probably we were asking too much of the technology. Uh, we came to this after, um, well, a roundabout way. So uh, another study came out that actually linked IL-6 in blood, in venous blood, to impulsivity in one of the scales that we had looked at. 
So once I got over that, like, ah, someone beat us, you know, I was like, hey, this is actually really cool. It worked. Uh, this research was done by Sarah Hill at Texas Christian University, and her research is really interested in low-level inflammation. So not like the inflammation you get from the coronavirus, but the inflammation you might get from seeing a lot of frightening information about the coronavirus. Uh, and so we want to get at that and see how that affects behavior. I'm out of time, but our next plan of attack is to bypass blood and go for spit. We're going to look at saliva samples. Now, a three-way collaboration between UB Morgan and TCU. Uh, one advantage of looking at spit is that not only is it easier to collect and handle, but it reacts to acute stress. So we can do all kinds of creative things in the lab to stress people out and then see what happens to their IL-6 levels. So stay tuned. Thanks. Thanks.